So the title, it's a good question because Apple directly compared their new MacBook Pros to machines with the highest end NVIDIA 3080 mobile GPUs. Now, yes, Apple fanboys, they didn't specifically state that they meant in gaming, but like it or not, and I don't, Apple is one of the biggest players in the gaming industry. By net profit, they might be the biggest, but that's in mobile gaming, stupid little kid games, real gamers playing RGB-laden battle stations with custom water loops, G Fuel, and hot enemy body pillows. Okay, maybe that's just me. But let's be frank here. Apple computers have never been the best option for gaming. The Commodore 64 had a better looking video output and significantly better sound capabilities than the Apple II. The 1990s Apple Pippin gaming console was a total flop. See my video on that here if you haven't already. And Halo was destined to be a Mac exclusive. That's right, at least until Microsoft swept in and bought Bungie. But then in 2005, Apple announced that it was moving away from IBM's PowerPC architecture in favor of x86 by way of Intel processors, the same chips that were put into the majority of competing Windows PCs. And for a good many years, Apple computers could game, even though they weren't made to game. Bootcamp brought support for native booting into Windows. Increasingly competent GPUs made games run adequately on the majority of Apple computers, and some models, especially more recent ones, run games legitimately Great. You get it? <laughs> Great, because cheese and... <sighs> the problem is that Apple's machines have never been price competitive. And gaming on a Mac was always a, well, if you have a Mac, you can game on it more than it was ever a legitimate recommendation against the same priced gaming PCs. Macs were never value kings. Well, at least not until Apple Silicon chips, which have perverted pervasive price to performance perceptions pertaining to Apple's computers. The new MacBook Pros ship with chips that unlike the M1 before them are anything but polite. Retaining the M1's efficiency strengths, but beefing up the quantity of CPU and GPU cores to make hotter, faster, meaner machines. And look, you've already seen a number of reviews and you've seen that yes, these chips are fast and the M1 Pro and Max GPU cores in particular can blaze through compute benchmarks. But compute benchmarks in real work is lame. Okay, yeah, look, games are fun and we're gonna get to those in a minute, but you do need to get real work done and that's where today's sponsor, Setapp, comes in. Setapp simplifies and streamlines software acquisition on the Mac without having to go out and find stuff on the web. Let me show you how. Let's say I accidentally deleted a file from one of our memory cards. This happens more often than you'd think. All I have to do is type uh, data recovery, I guess. And uh, yeah, check it out. It suggests Distro, which is a very popular Mac app. I press install and I get instant full functionality. There's no trials, no more credit card numbers that are strewn across the web, no more license management. Check it out. Boom, we're done. <laughs> Setapp provides full access to over 200 of the Mac's very best apps. Using multiple apps, I can revamp my workflow from productivity to utility, task management, and so much more. Uh, think tasks with Setapp and try it free for seven days by clicking the link in the video description. To game on a PC, you typically install Steam or the launcher of your choice, you download your games and you're done. <laughs> on a Mac, it's not even remotely that simple. Now make no mistake, you can go out and download and install Steam and acquire a number of games, but the quantity of binaries compiled for Mac are few. In my library of 408 games, just 93 of them offer native Mac support. And of those 93, just 14 of them are AAA titles. Now, I'll talk about the performance of the few resource-intensive Mac games in a bit, but first, what if you want to play games that are not supported by Mac OS? On old Intel machines, this was easy. Open up Bootcamp, install Windows, AIE está. But on Apple Silicon, that's a no-go. <laughs> you can't virtualize x86 operating systems, only those compiled for ARM. Now, you might be wondering, well, why doesn't Bootcamp support Windows for ARM? That's a thing, right? 
Well, there's a lot of reasons from drivers to architecture, but the biggest reason is that it is literally against Microsoft's end user license agreement, which is honestly hilarious. Apple has stated that they're open to the idea, but they just can't. But anyone who's built a Hackintosh knows that just because you can't doesn't mean you can't. Parallels for Mac supports the installation of Windows 11 for ARM. Now, that's an ISO that you can only get upon acceptance into the Windows Insider program, but it's pretty easy to get in. And once you do, it's Windows. As of last year, Windows for ARM brought support for 64-bit app emulation, and this year they announced ARM 64 EC, which is kind of similar to Mac OS's universal binaries. But for all intents and purposes, what we have here is a Mac virtualizing Windows ARM, which when it plays games, emulates Windows x86. It sounds like a recipe for disaster, but it's kind of not, at least not 100% of the time. Select titles like Overwatch performed surprisingly well, and even older, more demanding titles like The Witcher 3 were perfectly playable, at least in so much as you looked at the FPS counter and not the game. <laughs> the issue we ran into with a lot of titles, and apparently it's a pretty common one, is that the game will just get hung up, uh, sometimes north of a second, on what seems like nothing. It's usually when it tries to load a new asset into memory. Now, I'm not sure if it's the way that Parallels works with DirectX or what, but it's really weird. Let me give you an example. The first time I perform a move or an attack in Overwatch, it's super slow. It freezes. But then once I've done it once, it's fine for the rest of the gameplay experience. It's bizarre. <laughs> now, is it game breaking? Uh, yeah, it, it can be. But it's usually just an annoying thing that fixes itself once the game has been up a few minutes. It's certainly playable, even though it's not ideal. Now, a more popular method of gaming on Mac OS historically has been using a compatibility layer like Wine. Now, the advantage to a compatibility layer, as opposed to something like Parallels, is that it translates system calls from a foreign system, Windows, to Mac OS using native system calls, rather than emulating hardware in software. And the theoretical advantage of this is better performance. But here's the thing, using Crossover, an app built on Wine, resulted in uh, some issues. Now, the app has a perfectly nice GUI, and there are a few options for enhanced gaming performance. And there were instances in which I found performance was indeed superior, but they are few. Grand Theft Auto V is one such game that can actually run quite well in crossover, at least in so much as you're using a controller and the latest nightly build of the software. For whatever reason, a keyboard and mouse combo would result in glitching, and the public release just straight up wouldn't launch the game. Here's the problem. I had to use a pirated version of GTA V because the official Steam version uses the Rockstar Launcher, which is unsupported in crossover and results in the game crashing. This was an overarching theme that I found while using both crossover and parallels. Most games just don't work. And anything that requires kernel-based anti-cheat, yeah, that's not going to work either. So Apex Legends, Fortnite, those are all out. Ah, and all DirectX 12 games fail to work as well. So good luck playing any AAA title from the last couple of years. Oh, furthermore, any game acquired from the Microsoft Store or from the Xbox app, those fail to launch because of DRM. So no game pass for you. Oh, and most Vulkan games also won't work in crossover, and none of them work in parallels. Oh, and last, yeah, any game that uses stream output, which is all Unity 3D games, those are not going to work. And, uh, oh yeah, last thing, um, if you have a 32-bit Vulkan game, those are going to run really slow because Molten VK, which is the compatibility layer that is available for macOS that translates Vulkan to Metal, that only works with 64-bit apps as of macOS Catalina. So Crossover has to use Wine's old DirectX to OpenGL translation, which is notoriously slow. Are, are you seeing a trend here? <laughs> yeah, it's not great. Now look, there are sites out there like Apple Gaming Wiki, amongst others, that have allegedly tested compatibility with these software titles and various Mac hardware, but I have found almost all of them to be woefully unreliable and inaccurate. Games that state they're supported just straight up won't launch. They're, they're not. And games that say they aren't supported sometimes are, like GTA V. Ugh. Now look, I don't know that I've been direct enough, so let me put it like this. 
Playing Windows titles on Apple Silicon Macs is such a nightmare. And it's so unexceptional if you even can manage to get it working that it's literally not even worth your time to try. So then, Quinn, what the heck is with the title? Is this just clickbait deception? No, there are three different categories where these new Macs really do excel at gaming. Hope I didn't break the screen on this. The first is emulation of retro game consoles. We ran both XMU, an original Xbox emulator, as well as the excellent Dolphin GameCube and Wii emulator. And they both work, in a word, perfectly. I was a bit shocked, but elated to see even the base model MacBook Pro pushing 4K 60fps in titles like Super Mario Galaxy 2. There are only a couple of games now that don't work with Dolphin, so to have such a vast library of games right at your fingertips is pretty cool, even if it's in a little bit of a legal gray area. Now, obviously, a real kind of natural emulation candidate would seem to be the Nintendo Switch. But sadly, the two emulators on the market that currently exist don't yet support macOS at all, Intel or Apple Silicon. Though Yuzu has said that they're working on it and it'll come eventually. So at what else can a Mac game? Well, you're gonna laugh because it is pretty silly, but Apple Arcade and iOS apps. We are now to the point where there are some legitimately impressive games available via Apple Arcade and the App Store, like the gorgeous The Last Campfire, published by Hello Games of No Man's Sky Infamy. Now look, in these types of videos, we tend to get super bogged down with specs and performance, but indie games are often some of the most fun out there. And thanks to game engines like Unity and Unreal, many of these indie games have native Mac binaries ready to go, and they play amazingly well on these new machines. But look, I know you've been waiting the whole video for the grand reveal of AAA gaming performance on the Mac. Or you just skipped here using chapter markers down below, in which case, shame on you. But with all the stars aligned, so the M1 Pro and M1 Max hardware, with intentionally ported games to the Mac, so ones that run on Apple's hardware-accelerated Metal Graphics API, the question becomes, can they match the performance of the best gaming Windows laptops? And the answer is surprisingly, yes. And they actually do it so well that even a disillusioned Mac enthusiast like myself finds himself absolutely blown away. In Dirt Rally at 4K Ultra settings, we were pushing well over 100 frames per second on the 16-inch MacBook Pro with the 32-core GPU M1 Max. By contrast, my Aorus Aero 15 with an NVIDIA 2070 Super Max-Q wasn't even able to average 60 frames per second at the same settings. Moving to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we found that the 16-inch M1 Max matched the performance of a Razer Blade with an NVIDIA 2080 Max-Q. Planet Coaster, a game ported recently to metal by Asper, runs like a dream, as well as I've ever seen it run on desktop PCs. Interestingly, all of these games, while still metal compatible, have not yet been ported to Apple Silicon. They're running through Rosetta. So it's not unreasonable, given what we know about Rosetta, to assume an additional 10 to 15% performance bump from a natively compiled binary. Amazing. And that brings us to the most recent, most tech demo-y game of them all, Myst, which is natively compiled for Apple Silicon and uses metal. Now, for a Mac user like me, it's easy to be wowed by the performance of this machine. I swear I don't have Stockholm Syndrome. But to a more discerning PC user, you're probably thinking, wow, a Mac finally matches the performance of a gaming computer that's only several hundred dollars less expensive instead of several thousand dollars less expensive. Great work, guy. But look, I wanna make a case for the MacBook Pro here and that's in efficiency. The total package TDP of the M1 is substantially, and I mean substantially, nearly 200 watts less than the Razer Blade 15 Advanced or Gigabyte Aero 15. I'm lucky to get five hours of battery life on those machines just doing everyday computing, whereas on the 16-inch MacBook Pro, I can get over 12 hours without a sweat. And gaming? <laughs> I was able to run the Dirt Rally benchmark on a loop at comparable brightness for hours and hours longer than the other laptops. And the last time I checked, and I'm no expert, but the last time I checked, battery life was kind of important in a laptop. But there are other advantages too. 
While other games or really any heavy GPU load can really get the MacBook Pro fans spinning, they are much quieter than the prior generation MacBook Pros. And while they're absolutely audible, they are not anywhere near deafening like their PC counterparts. Factor in the significantly brighter, higher resolution, higher refresh rate display, amazing speakers that can be heard crystal clear above the quietly whirring fan noise, and suddenly this machine doesn't just look competent, but takes the crown for the most well-rounded, powerful, practical gaming laptop ever. Until you remember the worst part of all of this, and that's that the Mac just doesn't have a good catalog of games that support metal. And even the ones that claim to support the Mac via OpenGL or Vulkan through Molten VK like CSGO, they often don't work on the M1 without Googling for weird fixes like modifying launch options. This is insanely janky. It doesn't matter how powerful your hardware is and how streamlined your graphics APIs are if nobody uses them. And nobody does. Apple has been pretending like gaming on Macs has been a thing in their keynotes for a few years now. But that's a lie, it's not. If Apple really wants to bring gaming to the Mac, and I think that this hardware clearly demonstrates that they're capable of making that happen, then they need to pony up the cash and financially incentivize game studios like the rest of the industry does to bring their games to the Mac. Or they need to just accept defeat and re-implement popular standardized graphics APIs like Vulkan, which they have gotten rid of. So that bringing games to the Mac isn't enormously tedious for game studios like it currently is today. Because ultimately, this has very little market share and very little return on investment. Now, you say that you care, Apple, so show it. Because right now, the only thing that you're showing is that you like taking 30% of the mobile gaming industry's revenue in exchange for basically nothing. Speaking of basically nothing, I sure would like it if you basically gave me a like on this video in exchange for nothing. If you didn't like this video, send it to someone that you don't like, because that costs you nothing and they're gonna hate it. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please let me know, have you been gaming on any Macs? And if so, what titles? Hello, Tomb Raider, I see you. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy.